So it's my real pleasure to introduce Dr. Beverly Reynolds. Um, since May 2003, Beverly has been chief of CSIRO Petroleum, and in, in July 2007, she was appointed Group Executive Energy, and we've just been talking to his amazingly large portfolio. Dr. Reynolds' career has spanned teaching, research, and the application of research to solve industry problems. She's the second chief of CSIRO Petroleum since it was created in 1993. And she was former foundation director and also the Woodside Chair with the University of Western Australia's School of Oil and Gas Engineering. Her research interests include offshore structural stability and production facility selection. Dr. Reynolds has also had industry experience in design, installation and operations, support for fixed and floating offshore um, platforms, both in Australia's Northwest Shelf, the North Sea, and in the Gulf of Mexico. In 2000, Dr. Ronalds was made a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, and is also a Fellow of the Institute of Civil Engineers and the Institute of Engineers Australia. In 2003, she was awarded the Prime Minister's Centenary Medal for services to Australian society in civil engineering. She's included in Engineers Australia's inaugural list of the 100 most influential engineers in 2004. It is a particular pleasure to invite Beverly, especially because we really do want more women in science and engineering. So, welcome. It's uh, an absolute delight to be here this afternoon uh, to participate in this very important series of lectures uh, that have been put together by uh, the Whitlam Institute. Um, um, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, first of all, uh, a little bit of the what. Um, what are fossil fuels uh, in the Australian context, uh, also regionally and globally? And then why? Um, why uh, am I here talking about fossil fuels this evening? And uh, what is uh, uh, the problem and uh, what will they look like going forward and a, a bit on the how as well in terms of likely technologies, likely new technologies going forward and some of the key uh, factors influencing that path forward. Um, it's uh, probably close to the end of, of a big day for most of you so I thought I would start up front with um, what I think some of the key messages are. Uh, first of all, uh, the world runs on fossil energy. Ongoing fossil energy in the way uh, that we've been using it up till now uh, brings uh, two major challenges to the fore. Uh, first of all, greenhouse gas emissions and second, uh, tightening supply. And uh, there's a, a really interesting relationship between those two challenges. And I think they're summed up beautifully by the opening sentence of the latest IEA World Energy Outlook, which I've put there at the, at the bottom. The world is facing twin energy-related threats, that of not having adequate and secure supplies of energy at affordable prices, and that of environmental harm caused by consuming too much of it. It's a, a beautiful dichotomy that we're facing at the moment. And um, to solve it, we need an energy revolution. Uh, easy to say, a little bit harder to do. Um, I'm a technologist, I'm an optimist, and so uh, my natural view is that technology will find a way. Um, but I think when you think of the enormity of the problem, it, it is... Um, it's not hard to become uh, a little bit pessimistic, I think. Um, and another challenge we have, I think, with this energy revolution, uh, not only the scale, but the fact that I don't think we know yet what it is. There's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. We need a new energy future, uh, but what is it going to be? It's uncertain and dynamic. And uh, then I think the, the last point I would like to make is I think Australia can play a key role in this energy future. And we probably shouldn't say that too often because in the end of the day, Australia is only around 1% of global GDP. But certainly I see Australia as having particular challenges and also particular opportunities and I would argue responsibilities to play a strong role uh, in the region in terms of our energy future. Okay, so back to the beginning. Uh, the world runs on fossil energy and um, 
that's because historically it's been uh, relatively cheap and uh, readily available and as a result of that it uh, underpins our economy. Okay, so the other side of the story then is that fossil energy emits greenhouse gases. And uh, again, this is a plot here showing um, the, the growth of those emissions over um, the period since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Now, I don't um, pretend to understand climate science, but listening to climate scientists, um, I, I think we can't but agree that um, there's a global experiment going on at the moment uh, with some really scary potential consequences and any risk management strategy would say uh, we should stop this as soon as we possibly can. Uh, the, the risks are enormous. Okay, so coming down to Australia. Um, in Australia we're particularly accustomed to cheap, readily available energy. Um, coal, uh, which underpins electricity generation, oil that underpins our transport economy and is also used in many products, and gas for which we also have large reserves. So as a result, uh, fossil fuels supply a whopping 95% of Australia's energy needs, one of the largest proportions of any country. We do have other choices. We've got uh, uranium, we've got uh, the sun, We've got wind, we've got our oceans, we've got uh, geothermal potential. So there are a lot of opportunities, but they all do differ in terms of efficiency, emissions, reserves, and of course, cost. Okay, and when we're talking about our energy endowment, uh, I feel it's really important that we don't just focus domestically. Um, there's a really strong nexus uh, in energy between Australia and the region and indeed we are one of the world's largest energy exporters. Back in um, the heyday of Bass Strait, we were sort of roughly speaking close to self-sufficient. Uh, that self-sufficiency is declining now, uh, both because um, Abair predicts that we will continue to want to use more oil, have increasing demand, uh, the lighter green line, and then also because our production is slowly declining. So uh, we can say that in all probability Australia has reached peak oil. It's not a nice smooth peak, it's more of a long bumpy plateau, but uh, there is not a very strong probability of us ever producing more than we produced in 2000 uh, when the peak happened. And um, as that um, self-sufficiency declines, uh, our trade gap will widen. And back in 2006, APIA predicted that that oil gap might be uh, worth $27 billion per year by 2015. And uh, the way the oil price is going, I'm sure that's likely to be conservative. So I want to explore this uh, peak a little bit more and particularly to give a couple of reasons why it's um, quite a, a long bumpy plateau rather than a sharp peak. And to do that I thought I'd um, zoom in on the UK which is um, a, a very important oil province or it has been, uh, one of the, the world's largest oil and gas uh, producers in its heyday and of course um, many of us would know has ha oil production and gas production have had a, a dramatic influence on the UK economy over the last few decades. 